May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed, took the time to pray. Somebody prayed for me. This week, I got a card from the seminary which I graduated from. And having received and signed cards like it before, I knew what it was about. And I smiled as I remembered the chapel duty of praying for alma mater strangers who had done the same before me. And the card read, prayer has been offered for you on May 14th, 2020. You are here because somebody prayed for you. The prayers of people we know and love, the prayers of strangers, and even our resurrected and ascended savior have brought us to this day. Through time and space, through good and bad, countless prayers have upheld and shaped us. Then raising his eyes in prayer, Jesus said, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right, and my life is on display in them. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me, so they can be one heart and mind as we are one heart and mind. Jesus knew the disciples would find it hard to stay focused on the work they were to continue in his name instead of trying to escape into the times when they could see him. He knew it'd be so easy to turn their attention to their angst about the uncertainty of their lives. After all, humans crave stability, predictability, and a sense of control. It's no surprise that when Jesus was taken from the disciples' sight, that they would want things to return to the way they were. And just when the disciples thought they had him back, you know, he appeared to them after their, his crucifixion. But yes, Jesus continued to do what he said he would do. Now granted, Jesus could get pretty cryptic in some of his teachings, but in all the gospel accounts, Jesus clearly told his disciples he would die, be raised on the third day, and join the Father in heaven. Jesus was clear about his intentions. And after Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And suddenly, two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? Yes, they were brought back to earth by the question of the men in white. Why do you stand, why do you stand there gazing into heaven? On being called back to life in the present, scripture tells us that the disciples returned to that upper room and immersed themselves in prayer. I have no doubt they remembered Jesus praying for them. I imagine they spoke of his clarity and recalled his words and works in community. I imagine like most humans, looking back at their experiences and what Jesus said, they probably had regrets about not getting it sooner. I imagine they thought about the choices they could have made and the lessons that could have been learned had they been more intent on being changed by what Jesus taught instead of wanting his teachings to fit into their comfort zone. But of course, hindsight is 2020. I'm equally convinced also 
But as they remembered the grace of Jesus' prayers, they were pulled out of a downward cycle of shame and being ruled by fear. Through their united prayers and the power of the Holy Spirit, they were able to pursue their common call to display Jesus' life to the world. And we are like the disciples sitting in that upper room, waiting for what comes next. For years, actually, the church has been avoiding what comes next. As we've contemplated how to be the church in the 21st century, in this unchurched time, when we've lost a place of prominence in society, we've also been like the disciples, staring into the sky. We've, been, we've spent some time, so much time, longing for the glory days. If only we had young people. If only we had the right programs. If only we had more money. If only fill in the blank. Our scripture today reminds us of our very present need to be attentive to the lessons of this day and not to rush the work that is being done in us in this time and the opportunity of just being in this time. The lessons of our readings in light of our current confinement during the pandemic are an invitation to have a well-rounded and mature faith life that makes use of discipline, self-denial, sacrifice. This time values lament and the ability to feel pain, sadness, grief, and loss without needing to skip over it. With our pandemic eyes and sensibilities, the woes of the world are right before us. And our capacity to develop the heart of Christ is growing as we feel pain and loss and commit to being present to our community in new ways. With the heart of Christ, we are becoming more mindful of the fact that we are not exceptional and above suffering. And this is not about romanticizing or accepting suffering, but about noticing and entering into the suffering of others, acknowledging our privilege if we have it, and looking for the healing and release that the world needs and God desires for us all. Before our confinement, I don't know how many conversations I had about the fact that people are the church, not the building. People are the church, not the building. It's hard for people to know that truth until they've experienced it. We have seen it and we know it to be true. And now that there is a rush to return to our buildings, even though it is known that we could cause harm to others by doing so, I'm praying that we will not forget the lesson that we have learned. And maybe in fact, we're still learning. I'm also praying that we will give ourselves the time to continue our upper room discernment and prayer. The circumstances of the day are asking, why are you standing here? looking toward heaven and urging us to make use of this time to ponder what is next for us as we pursue displaying Jesus's life in the world. And it might be simplistic, but discipleship, that's it. Discipleship, practices that lead to a Jesus-centered life will give us a path to be who we are called to be. Yes, Jesus prayed for us. My life is on display in them, for I'm no longer going to be visible to the world. Guard them. Guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me, so they can be one heart and mind, as we are one heart and mind. Jesus knew discipleship as a lifelong work with many facets that must be cultivated within the context of prayer. Our mission to display Jesus's life to the world is a practice of balancing the nurture of our spiritual life, living in and becoming beloved community and loving the world God created. 
Jesus knew we would need to be reminded of the need to pray and the centrality of prayer in all aspects of how we live as a body of Christ. And I'm so grateful that no building can contain the shelter and foundation of Jesus's words, deeds, and prayers for us, and how they bind us together at all times and in all places. Thanks be to God for, sustaining, for the sustaining prayers of our Savior. Jesus prayed for me in the garden of Gethsemane, took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad he prayed, took the time to pray. Jesus prayed for me.